see it. Can yes. You see my share, good. Okay. Well, here we all are. And um, so our guest tonight is Kim Mayer uh, from the Old Stone House in Brooklyn. And um, welcome, first of all. Mm -hmm. And actually, the first thing we should do is we should let Todd do his commercial. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Um, and so happy you're joining us tonight, Kim. I uh, can't wait for the interview. Uh, my name is Todd Whitley. I'm the executive director of the Masterwork Music and Art Foundation. And for over 50 years, the foundation has been supporting excellence in the arts in a number of ways. So for those of you that don't know, um, we now currently offer three levels of awards. The first and most impressive is a premier award. It's a $10,000 gift to an artist or an arts organization. Um, we have community grants awards, and we also have competitive awards at a, a lower level. We um, offer some free virtual classes and this interview series, which we're all really excited about, hosted by our beloved jo uh, board member, uh, Joe White. So Kim, um, so um, happy you're with us and can't wait to hear more about the Old Stone House in Brooklyn. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Okay, so um, I, wanna, I do want to thank Carol May for uh, introducing us to your work and providing us with this opportunity. Um, so it says here uh, that the site consists of the reconstructed 1699 Vecht Cortelieu House, uh, the J.J. Byrne Playground, and Washington Park. Um, well, it really sounds like a community center as much as anything else, like a place for the whole community to, to congregate and gather and share. Um, how'd that all happen? <laughs> well, uh, we very much operate as a town square, and I just want to thank you for inviting me to join you tonight, uh, because uh, Carol May and Tim Watkins have been such an important part of our work at the house, creating the permanent exhibit that we have there, and you'll get a, a sample of some of the, the work that we've done together. But the house has a very, very long history, going all the way back to the 17th century. So I have a little presentation, and I'm just going to share my screen and we'll run through just the early, you know, how we got to where we are Wonderful. in a little bit. So bear with me. Uh, all right. So our mission is quite broad. Uh, we are an independent not-for-profit organization. Uh, the building is actually owned by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and we are the Conservancy Organization. And our work focuses on fostering civic engagement in the community through relevant educational, environmental, cultural, and recreational programs, acknowledging that we are on traditional Lenape land, and the Dutch colonization that occurred in the mid 17th century and the impact of individual choice and action in the American Revolution. So what does that really translate to? Well, it's a, a path to the history of the site through many different avenues from uh, all of the recreation that takes place in the playground to Revolutionary War reenactments, to environmental programs in our 1.5 acres of gardens, to participatory budgeting with our local council members, and to a vast array of theater and music and contemporary art exhibition programs. Well, so I'm I'm reading here. Though well, this is going back even this is going back to the Dutch here. I noticed the yes, the going North all the way River. Back to the Dutch. Yeah, and uh, so. This is before the the next thing I have on my sheet, but the, um, so this, um, okay, I can see, uh, 
So this is a very early map, the Manitous map, and it shows you the early Dutch colonization of Manhattan. I'm going to use, so you, can, right. you can see my pointer. Here is Manhattan at the time. And then this is what was to become Brooklyn. You can see very spotty uh, settlement. Mm -hmm. And the Vax were one of the first families uh, to actually build a substantial farm. Uh, by the mid 1600s, the Dutch had essentially forced the Lenape out of Brooklyn because they were very interested in the agricultural work that had gone on for thousands of years. And so the Vex built their home. This is a photograph from about 1865 of the original Vect farmhouse on the shores of the Gowanus, which was a creek at the time, not the super fun site that we know today. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a photograph of the reconstruction of the house in the 1930s under the aegis of Robert Moses, who, as many of you may know, was uh, the premier city planner for New York really shaped the New York that we know today. The summer that the Oldstone House was reconstructed opened with its playground. There were also 200 other playgrounds that opened that same summer. Uh, there was an elevated train along Fifth Avenue that had actually opened in 1883 in time for Washington Park, the ball field that was on the site. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and then this is the house today in our playground. You can see it's nicely settled in the, in the center of a very, very active playground. We have upwards of 2,000 park visitors every day and, uh, and about an acre and a half of gardens. As I mentioned, we're next door to a middle school and within walking distance of 10 elementary schools. Well, that's great. The uh, well, the, here I was. Uh, this was my next thing to talk about. the uh, The Battle of Brooklyn was actually, I guess, the largest actual battle in the Revolutionary War. Um, Arguably, yes. Yeah. And um, the um, you know, lots of the rest are well. I mean, I live in a town where we talk about a battle, but it was a skirmish, really. Um, but um, so this um, this I'm assuming is a depiction of the battle. Yes, this is William Alexander at the Battle of Brooklyn. So the Battle of Brooklyn took place on August 27, 1776. It was the first official battle fought by the United States Army. Uh, the British had come from Boston to New York, and the Americans didn't have a trained national army yet. It was a series of colonial militias coming um, to support this very nascent cause. And uh, the battle itself only lasted about six hours on the morning of August 27th. Mm -hmm. But it was a battle that really changed the outcome of what the British expectation of their um, their invasion of the colonies was going to, to uh, be. Because the Maryland Regiment came up to New York. Uh, they were fairly well trained and realizing at the outset of this battle that the British had created this pincer maneuver that was going to cut off the American escape. Uh, the Maryland Regiment attacked the British around the old stone house and kept an escape route open for the Pennsylvania riflemen that were up in what's now Prospect Park and allowed the escape of the Americans across the Gowanus Creek. Uh, it was quite a vicious battle. Um, the British uh, also were fighting with Hessians who were mercenaries that were fighting, uh, paid to fight with the British. Um, they were very young and very frightened. And uh, the fact that the Americans were able to hold this escape route open and hold their own and get behind the lines of Brooklyn Heights was quite a surprise. And over the course of the next two days, the Americans gathered every boat that they could find in the Brooklyn area. And they ferried the entire American army across the East River early in the morning of August 29th uh, through fog and wind. And uh, when the British arrived at the shore of the river, they saw the Americans completely escaped and had started to head up the west side. And the Americans were uh, able to get up to Fort Washington, which is up near today's George Washington Bridge which is where the next battle took place uh, on September 12th. So 
the fact that the Americans are able to escape uh, began this long war of attrition that lasted for about seven years, and Brooklyn was occupied until 1783 by the British. The, um, well, the other historical thing, um, I don't know, only people who are as old as I remember that there was such a thing as the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> And remember how it, it, some it people have never been. gotten over it, Joe. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, no, I know. I've, I, I've talked with some of them. I, I, I was going to say it may have been the most ardently loved uh, baseball team in the history of the sport. Um, well, I don't know, but they were affectionately known as Dem Bums. Exactly. And so how was this? Uh, so where was the birthplace of the Dodgers or is it, uh, was Ebbets Field uh, nearby? Yeah, I just want to back up just a tiny bit because um, we, we didn't really talk about uh, the education program, oh, our okay. aspect of the battle. And so this is actually our contemporary exhibit that May and Watkins created for us mm. uh, with these beautiful panels and all of these uh, wonderful dioramas and peak holes and a uh, very focus, big focus on the Declaration of Independence and a uh, great canon. So it's really a wonderful exhibit with a, a board game about the battle. You can come and visit during our open hours and play. Um, and it's been a great way to create a new generation of history lovers who really are interested in the battle itself. Um, but the Dodgers, so we get a lot of visitors who have never gotten over the move to LA. Yes. And the field was actually part of the original Vect family farm. In the mid uh, 19th century, the Cortellius who had bought the old stone house from uh, the Vect family sold the house to Edwin Litchfield, who is the original developer of the center of Park Slope. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with um, the neighborhood, Brooklyn Park's headquarters is in Litchfield Villa, which is up on Prospect Park West and Fifth Street. And Edwin Litchfield's office is down on the corner of Third Avenue and Third Street near the Whole Foods. And um, he developed the farm as a recreation site. And you can see, and here, this is just the last vestiges of the original Vect home and this grandstand uh, and the elevated train along Fifth Avenue and a big open playing field, uh, which is where the Brooklyn Baseball Club started out. And the Brooklyn Baseball Club is the team that eventually became the Dodgers when they moved across Fourth Avenue and they had to dodge the trolleys. Okay. So to get to their new ballpark. Uh, Brooklyn was an exciting place for baseball. It was, there's a great uh, website for those of you that are baseball fans called brooklynballparks.com. It was one of the first places where you could watch baseball and drink beer at the same time, starting a national pastime. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, Brooklyn, ahead of the curve always, even, even in the 19th century. Okay. Now the um, I, I, and you can indeed you can just see the uh, the old stone house there in that corner. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, so moving right along. So uh, you know our we've tried to incorporate all of these elements into our programming today. And so we have a very active environmental education program. The house is surrounded by these lovely gardens. Um, when I started working uh, at the house in 2004, the entire surrounding area was just asphalt. It was a very hardscaped playground. So our mm. work has really been focused on creating these beautiful public spaces. Well, the, I was going to say that one of the things that's really wonderful about this site is that it has the history and you can experience the history, but yet there's, it's a part of today. You know, it's not something where people go to have, look at stuffy old exhibits and be bored. Uh, <laughs> so there's lots try to of, avoid that. like there's a lot to do. Yes, I think one of the things that all public history organizations share is the desire for relevance. You know, mm -hmm. why is it 
why is the revolution meaningful to us today? I think, um, you know, without delving into contemporary politics, we are still arguing about many of the same issues that no kidding. we've been arguing about since the and, 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 and if, I think if one came back in 100 years, you'd find that that probably won't have changed. Probably not. Uh, but, you know, but, um, I, if we if we don't, if we're not aware of it, we're doomed to repeat past mistakes. So exactly. our goal is really to engage our community in their civic life, uh, to realize that their individual actions really do make a difference. And so uh, a big part of our work is focused on what's now known as mutual aid. Uh, but is the kind of work that happens in small towns all over the country. Uh, we sent out 580 coats from our coat drive this morning to two family shelters that are uh, down the block from us on 4th Avenue. Um, we have a toy drive. Uh, we do... Um, you know, we work with the local food bank to they uh, garner the produce from our gardens. So there's really a lot that can be done that relates to the history of the site that's actually very connected to the community. Uh, and I think that people can understand through volunteerism that their actions really can make a big difference in the life of their communities. Yeah. Todd mentioned that we should ask, I should ask about the Historic House Trust of New York City. And so, yes, we are part of the Historic House Trust of New York City, which is a group of 23 sites uh, that are located in New York City parks. And so in Brooklyn, our colleague sites are uh, the Wyckoff Farmhouse, which is actually the oldest extant building in New York and a wonderful place. Um, and Lefferts Homestead, which is a historic home that was moved into Prospect Park uh, after it was developed by Olmsted and Boggs. Uh, there are also just great sites throughout the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. And you could really, um, you know, spend a few years taking just visits. visiting all those places. wonderful places. Yeah. Yeah, they're really wonderful. And each of us has a slightly different um purview uh, as the newest building and without many of the preservation issues that plague our colleague sites, we're able to have a very active public education program, uh, as well as a very extensive presenting program in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, most of these sites have much smaller spaces than ours, um, but we have a wood-fired hearth, and so we do quite a bit of foodways programming from the garden to, uh, you know, prepared meals. During the pandemic, we had a chef who would come in and uh, prepare meals on Saturday nights that people could come and pick up and take home with them. We have a wonderful music program. Uh, Eleanor Binman is a fantastic pianist who gives a regular annual concert. The, you know, Robert Moses gets a bad rap for a lot of things, but one of the things about the Old Stone House is this great room, which is very much a colonial revival space. You know, the original house would have had a whole warren of small rooms to accommodate the whole family and another uh, floor to accommodate the enslaved that lived on the site. Uh, but this is very much evocative of the 1930s era when we were looking backwards toward the colonial time and creating this sort of fantastic great room, with this open timbered space. And it has really amazing acoustics. So it's a perfect place for chamber music and jazz. And we also use it for our contemporary exhibition space, uh, as well as all our education programming. And before the pandemic, pretty much a birthday party every single Saturday and Sunday for the <laughs> under 10 crowd. Well, you just mentioned that word that we're all uh, hopefully coming out of right now, but um, how did that uh, affect what you were doing? Because the, um, I know the, I, you know, the historic sites that I'm, I'm around up here, they're still trying to figure out how to bring back things safely and uh, ongoing challenge. But It uh, is, I think we all... Every uh, public facing not-for-profit organization has dealt with this challenge. Uh, I think our location in the center of the community in a park with a great variety of open space uh, was our salvation. 
we were locked down from April to June of 2020. And it was a really very, it was very sad to see these small children with their hands on the gates, just wishing to be in the playground. Oh, it's heartbreaking. And, um, I no. personally would sneak in and let myself in <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people at home working, um, but we really pivoted to presenting outdoor programming. So we had chamber music groups rehearsing in the garden spaces and dance organizations rehearsing out in the little lawn area. We have a little synthetic lawn in front of the house. We had uh, tons of programming going on on the open turf field. We really built our volunteer program, um, which had been, you know, just two or three people in previous years. But over the course of the pandemic, uh, our garden volunteer crew grew to 30 people. Uh, we also implemented an Earn to Learn program with the Aliforni Center, hosting interns on the site, mm -hmm. and a partnership with the League School, uh, which offered workforce training for developmentally disabled adults. And we were able to take the time uh, without having sort of our usual hectic indoor schedule to really look at our exhibition and our permanent exhibition and our interpretation and take that time to expand uh, to include the Lenape history of the site, uh, thanks to an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant uh, that we had garnered. So it was challenging. Um, we were very fortunate to get two rounds of PPP. We were able to keep most of our staff, we did lose one longtime staff member who really focused it on events and public programming. And because that budget line essentially uh, was eliminated, um, yeah. we had to sort of figure other things out, but we were able to hire in uh, a young woman who had worked with us as a scenic designer and house manager for our theater program and create a new job for her as program director. So. Uh, many challenges, but also many opportunities to really engage with the community and really help people understand our role as the Conservancy organization, because uh, New York City parks are much livelier, better managed spaces if there is a strong friends group or a Conservancy organization on site. Right. The... Um... Well, the, I, I have two, this is the two questions here. I normally sort of do the questions that Todd sketches out in advance, but sort of is kind of the operant word. But I, um, this one's a good one though. Um, so what of all of the things that you've managed to accomplish there are you most proud of? What's the thing? I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, when I first started working at the house, it was a very uh, moribund public space. I actually came to the site because I was the co-president of the PTA at the school next door. And I couldn't understand why this lovely little park in the middle of our very active neighborhood was, you know, covered in broken glass and had one piece of playground equipment and, um, you know, this sort of terrible dog run and the house was never open to the public. So the board had invited me over um, to ask why the schools weren't coming for field trips. And having been on a couple of those field trips with my children, we had a whole conversation about, you know, what it means to be a public history organization and what the progressive uh, education programs in the elementary schools in the area were really focused on. And uh, they were hoping to find a new executive director. And so they hired me uh, in 2004. And since that time, uh, you know, I've learned a lot about navigating city politics, navigating um, uh, capital, the capital budgeting system, the expense budgeting system, grants, things that I really had no experience with before I started at the house. Uh, but in that time, we've overseen a complete renovation to the park uh, for all the recreation areas and all the playground areas. And uh, we obtained landmark status 
from New York State, uh, which the House hadn't had up until that point. And we had great help from um, the team at New York State Parks, really looking at the 1930s era as the, uh, the preservation focus. And we're now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which we weren't before. And we created our beautiful permanent exhibit uh, with May and Watkins. And um, Carol and, and Tim were so generous with us because even though my colleague Maggie Weber, who runs our education program and I had um, fairly good historic knowledge. We're not curators and we're not exhibition designers. And so it really took us five years to raise enough money and focus the exhibit in a way that made sense. And they were incredibly patient with us uh, during that time. Uh, we've also established a contemporary art exhibition program. We do four contemporary art exhibitions a year. And one of our proudest uh, pandemic accomplishments was actually uh, maintaining that exhibition program and continuing to pay the artists that were participating uh, through the pandemic. And we have a very active performing arts presentation program as well. Uh, we have, we host pre-pandemic 220 classes, uh, school groups a year, uh, but through the pandemic, we created a whole series of online resources and uh, video programs and uh, virtual field trips and Zoom field trips, uh, which have actually been, pretty successful. Um, the kids have really learned how to handle this uh, kind of online programming and with a little advanced preparation, they come up with great questions and, uh, and it's really quite fun. And uh, we have programming 365 days a year and our budget's grown. I mean, when I started at the house, we had $1,500 in the bank and now our budget is $350,000 a year. So that feels very good. It's also more stable. I don't, fret so much. Uh, you know, I feel like we have a much better individual donor base. That's been a huge accomplishment. And our overall visitation has increased to 45, more than 45,000 people annually for the house. And we have over 500,000 park users. Uh, so it's been very, very exciting to see that growth, but also to have the opportunity to see um, the changes that have taken place in the park because to do work where you see the fruits of your labor in a very uh, visceral way, you know, to see all these beautiful gardens and to see this active public space and to see this lively house. Um, just for example, yesterday was a not a typical Sunday. Uh, we had a portrait workshop with the artist Diane Hebert, whose work is currently on view in the Great Room. We had a Kids Rock for Kids concert out on our little lawn area. We had uh, a group of community members sorting those 600 coats uh, for the coat drive. And then we had a concert in the Great Room in the afternoon with Hudson Valley Sally. Um, and that is not an unusual day for us. So it feels so wonderful to be part of this very vibrant organization. Uh, that was exactly the word that I was uh, going to say too. That's, uh, no, that's just wonderful. And um, well, thank you for everything you do. Now, the one thing I would like to know, is that the end of your presentation? Oh, well, let's see. I have just a couple more things. You know, what are we looking oh, forward let's to? Let's see them. Well, this is the sort of bird's eye view of the space, all of these uh, renovations. And this is the house right here. And our hope in the coming years is actually to build an annex uh, that would create a flexible space that would seat up to 100 people, you know, for those of you that are, are city dwellers, uh, you understand how challenging it is to find a space for an event for your family or an event for your school or for your community group uh, that is not, you know, ridiculously expensive and is accessible. So that's one of our, our big goals. And we actually just learned that as part of the Gowanus rezoning process, uh, we've been allocated $10.9 million. So we'll be moving forward and seeing where that takes us. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, a nice building that sort of evokes the kinds of uh, 
seaside open pavilions uh, that can open to the community and then be closed up for, for bad weather. Um, you know, that'll just sort of be the, the capstone to the work that we've done in the space. Um, but I hope you'll all come and visit us, especially in the spring when we have these gorgeous uh, apple trees outside and, and there's always something going on. Um, and we also hope to extend our interpretation out into the garden area so that we can focus more on the Lenape history of the site and really creating a space uh, because people might not be aware, but New York City actually has one of the largest indigenous communities of any city in the nation. So uh, to be able to really uh, make space and continue that story and raise awareness of that contemporary native community is really important to us. The, um, well, before we go, I would just like to say, if there's any questions from the folk who are listening in with us, uh, you, if you can type them in the chat, that would be great. And let's see if anybody's... People hate being put on the spot. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I think I will say but, that, um, you know, for those of you that are involved with history organizations in your communities, uh, there are so many opportunities to engage with the public. And I feel like a big part of my job is saying yes uh, to people's ideas as they come forward. And I've found that in the beginning, maybe the programming was a little scattershot, uh, but as we've evolved as a presenting organization, the quality of the programming and the artists that were brought to the space have really um, grown in their capacity and uh, the quality of their work. And it's been very exciting to see uh, these organizations or artists kind of incubate within our space and to grow. Uh, public theater was such an important part of the outdoor work that we did in the park, um, both for, uh, you know, main stage kind of adult equity showcase programming, but also um, Spellbound, which was a theater that focused solely on children under the age of five. Uh, mm -hmm. They started out working with us when they were a very new organization and evolved to become an award-winning company over the 10 years that we worked with them. So that is, you know, Great to see. Well, Carol had uh, has a question. Uh, your organization, of course, she does. <laughs> of course, she does. Um, <laughs> your organization has such a broad scope. How do you determine direction and decide on the next area of growth? Well, that is a very good question because it was one of the difficulties that we had uh, when I first started out. This very broad mission, this very broad history, this long history, uh, and being able to focus in to uh, a more digestible amount of information. Uh, so the core of our programming is really, was for many years focused on the Battle of Brooklyn because it's directly aligned with the fourth and seventh grade curriculums in New York state. And so for our purposes in obtaining grants um, from the New York State Council on the Arts or the Department of Cultural Affairs, we had to really hone in on this particular area of our history and uh, why the Battle of Brooklyn was important. And uh, I think the relevant conversations around choice and individual actions and how you can serve your community really close the loop on how um, Americans joined into the Battle of Brooklyn and how Americans can join into their community civic engagement today. Uh, we really try to focus on those two, um, the link between those two areas. And then as we've moved forward and as the conversation around public history has expanded, we realized that we needed to tell a better story of the long history of the site and the fact that we are all living in Lenapoking and we are all on Lenape land. And there's a huge contribution from the native community early on to helping the Dutch colonists survive. Uh, and then also the impact of enslavement and how that built 
New York as the city we know today. So there's the core story, but then also the expanded story that tells a fuller history where the community can really see themselves reflected more fully in the history of the site. Yeah, the, um, I think I saw, yes. Uh, Tim says, wonderful, Kim, especially the new funds to expand with. Thank you. <laughs> well, anyway, this has been a wonderful, wonderful half hour. And thank you so much for sharing all of the wonderful work you're doing. And um, I'm, um, I'm not sure when I will get there, but I'm going to be there sometime in the next, probably in the spring. I think those apple trees look very inviting. It's very inviting and it's a great spot. And we're on a wonderful neighborhood for a day trip. There are places to go to brunch and wonderful places to shop. So we're really very lucky in our uh, in our community. And, you know, just for the focus of those of you that are trying to figure out how to make a life in the arts, um, you know, Todd had asked earlier how I came into my role. I was an art history major in college um, to my parents' dismay, but I have had gainful employment <laughs> ever since I graduated. Um, but I learned over time that there are many ways to be involved in the arts. I started out working in an art gallery. I managed an artist studio. I worked with a not-for-profit arts organization that bridged the gap between business and the arts, helping uh, businesses learn how to create sponsorship programs with the arts. And then uh, when I came to the Old Stone House, it was really the culmination of many of my interests, not only community organizing, but also how to serve small and medium-sized arts organizations and individual artists and create a space for them where they would be in community and create a rich, uh, accessible experience for our neighbors. Um, because it's hard to go to the theater or to go see a, a movie or to hear a concert. Uh, a lot of our audience mem our audience at the house are families with young kids. So to be able to walk, you know, 10 blocks, two blocks and have this rich cultural life in your community is really important. And, and uh, you know, I think thrilling for a lot of people. And Brooklyn has grown and expanded and evolved and gentrified in many ways since I first moved there in 1983, but there is still a lot of great free programming available. And um, you just have to look for the opportunities and not be afraid to say yes uh, to an opportunity that presents itself. Uh, because the pathway is there to, you know, raise funds and create a sustainable organization and a sustainable life for yourself. You can't be afraid. The um, no, one of the uh, joys of doing these interviews is that we, I mean, we've met a lot of wonderful artists and dancers and uh, musicians, and we've also met uh, some really wonderful people in the administration of the arts. And you know. The other folk, all the artists don't get to do what they do without them. You know, and yeah. so thank you for being one of them. That's really, <laughs> it's a wonderful contribution. And thank you for sharing this time with us. Uh, Todd, I think it's your turn again. Well, I just wanted to say that I totally added seeing, uh, being able to view the peak holes in the exhibit to my must see list. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to do that. Um, Kim, uh, thank you uh, for all you do, bringing not only history to life, but community to life in Brooklyn. And uh, thank you for joining us and sharing your time with us tonight. Uh, folks, My great pleasure to be with you. Oh, great. Um, uh, for more about Masterwork, um, uh, please visit masterworkarts.org uh, or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, for more about um, this uh, um, interview and uh, more A Life in the Arts, um, you'll see postings there as well. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Okay. And there.